Dinner was the most common form of food aid for which the recipient paid one penny, and it became known universally as the penny dinners. In Dublin, um, in particular, it became known as, they became known as the stew house because what they got every day was stew. Here we have um, just some, not all of them. These are some of the charities that existed in the city uh, before, 1930, before the lockout. Um, just to let you know that, that, that they were being fed by various, um, various charities. And there's, there's also, it would have, I didn't want to put too much on and overcrowd you with this, but there was also other, fa other faiths, the Jewish, the Jewish community, the Methodist community, the Presbyterian community, and the C of I community all had methods of aid for their workers. And contrary to what sometimes people think, all the workers who were poor were not all Catholic. They came from across across all of the different fates, and none. During the lockout, some new providers came, on, came into being. Now, I'm using the word providers because I think it's the best word to use in the context of where I'm talking. Um, hold on, I'll give you the Penny Dinners photographs first. Now, that, my estimate, my, that to me is Denzel Lane. And Denzel Lane, just to tell you, it was a Penny Dinners, and it was non-denominational. It was founded by a group of women who lived um, around the corner in Merrion Square, and it was founded in the 18, late 1880s, 1890s, and they were producing, um, they were feeding the poor from that time, and they had, um, ex you know, health, they looked after health, they did all kinds of amazing work. This is the Penny Dinners um, at the, the Penny Dinners um, in several places, the Sisters of Charity, and you see at the bottom there, the Penny's Dinner Hall, St. Lawrence O'Toole, several places in Dublin, that's in the North Dock area, and then we have the Holy Faith School in the Coombe, where they were feeding children, um, during lunchtime, and you can see they're all nicely lined up there for the photographer. The new, we have the Ladies' Relief Committee formed by the Catch, Catch and Sherlock, the Lady Mayoress of Dublin, the Dublin Food Fund, which Francis talked about earlier this morning, um, the British Trade Union, Union Council, sorry, my mistake, um, they sent money, and they, it was called the Dublin Food Fund. Um, so I'm going to stay with the Dublin Food Fund just to keep it in the context of this paper. There were two food kitchens at Liberty Hall, which I'll talk about as we go through, one on the Larkin and the other on the Connolly. And then at the end, we have the Dublin Children's Distress Fund, founded by the Archbishop of Dublin, Dr. William Walsh. On the 25th of September, a month after the lockup began, Catherine Sherlock founded the, the Ladies' Relief Committee. And the purpose of this committee was to provide for the necessities of life for a very large number of women and children who were rendered temporarily destitute owing to the labour crisis. The remit, how they operated, was they collected money. They collected money every week. They made appeals for money. And when they collected the money, they distributed grants to the charities already feeding, feeding school children. And as you can see here, all of these, all of these, um, all of these children and parishes were receiving grants from this charity um, to help feed children. Now, very briefly, in 1906, the um, School Meals Act was brought in by the Parliament in Westminster, but Ireland was excluded from the Act. And there had been many efforts um, made to try and have Ireland included, but it wasn't uh, included. Um, Dublin City Council, or corporation at that time, were not interested. Um, they would have been, because it would have been charged on the rates. So it was very political, and these, these schools are feeding children because there's no other way of feeding the children. But they're already doing this, just so we know that there is philanthropy in the city. The Dublin Bread Company, which was in O'Connell Street or Sackville Street, they gave this committee 100 pints of soup every day. And this was distributed in four schools in the, in the centre of the city. After a calendar month, almost a calendar month after the lockup began, the, t the British TUC convened a, special they convened a special meeting before that, but the first food ship arrived in Dublin. Now, they had pledged 5,000. When, when they set it up, they pledged 5,000 to start it off. And then they set up um, a fund, and money came in from all quarters. The, the, the money came in from breathtaking, totally breathtaking when you see the list of people who sent money, and it was amazing. And I think they raised something off the top of my head around 93,000 pounds in 1913 terms, and we'd have to translate that. Cadbury's offered to send them a large consignment of cocoa as part of the relief supplies. So we're staying with the Dublin Food Committee. The hair was greeted in Dublin with much fanfare, speeches, and liberal amounts of bunting. There was criticism from amongst some of the business people, 
that the money was not being spent in Dublin. But James Larkin said if the £5,000 had been sent in hard cash and distributed in five shilling pieces or even half sovereigns, it would have not been so powerful a factor as a food chip. Harry Gosling, who was the president of the National Transport Workers Federation, explained that the funds were to be used to send, were used to send food in order to avoid the risk of any money, I quote, any money being spent on drink or paid away for rent. The, doc, the hair docked at the South Keys at the city of Dublin Steam Packet Company sidings, down John Rogerson's Key, that area, and this was the first of 11 food ships that came to Dublin during the duration of the lockout. So we have 11 until the 28th of January. These are the numbers of ships who came. Um, I just couldn't find some of the names, but I'm very proud that I tracked down most of them. The SS Hare, the first ship, the SS Hare was unloaded and food was brought to the old Manchester company sheds on John Rogerson's Quay, where a man called Patrick Kenny was put in charge. Kenny himself was a locked out worker and he was appointed by the Dublin Food Fund to organise um, organize the food supply depot. I think it, it's a better, I like the word food supply depot better. And he took sole charge of it and he appears to have been very, very good at organising people because as you heard earlier this morning, it was very dignified. People came, they went through and it was very, very dignified. No food parcels were distributed from Liberty Hall. There is, um, there is some, in some quarters, people have this notion that they were distributed from Liberty Hall. They weren't, it wasn't possible. It would have been total madness to try and distribute it from Liberty Hall. The Manchester sheds remained the centre of distribution for the duration of the lockout. Now, workers, members of the union, um, were given a, vo a food voucher. Um, so without the food voucher, there was no food parcel. Now, those people, and Francis made reference to us as well, there are many workers who were not members of the union. They didn't have a food voucher, and we'll come back to that again. From early Saturday morning on the 28th of September, 1913, men, women and children began to queue on the quayside. And by 8 o'clock that night, the food parcels had all been landed. And it's estimated that about 9,000 people had received food relief that day. And other parcels were sent out to union members in County Dublin and Dunleary, Kingstown, Dunleary, Clondalk and, and Swords. Now, the, the, food, the food parcel, we are told, is um, £20 in weight. And when I was going over my notes, I totally changed the way I was doing this yesterday. Um, for weeks, I kept trying to visualise £20 of weight. If someone says, OK, you've got a husband and three children, or you've got a wife and three children, go out and do the shopping and buy £20 of food for five days for the family. And you think, OK, where do I start? So what I did was I went back through the sources yesterday and um, I broke it down. So the food parcel, the first, on the first ship, we had three quarters of a pound of butter or margarine, they're not quite sure which it was, so I left the two in. Quarter pound of tea, two pound of sugar, typo, two pound pot of jam, a two pound loaf of bread, 10 pound of potatoes, and some dried fish and biscuits, which I don't have the weight for. But if you count two, four, six, seven, so the dried fish and biscuits, um, oh, and tinned fish, uh, no, tinned milk, condensed milk. Um, I don't know what size the tin was either. Um, I have that on my notes, I forgot to put it there. And the 10 pound of potatoes. There again, visualising 10 pounds of potatoes, because now when we go shopping, they come in one kilo bags, two kilo bags, three kilo bags. So I was trying to visualise. So I took, dug out under my cupboard and I found some potatoes. And if it was 10 pounds of potatoes for five days, that's two pounds of potatoes per day for a family of five. And that's what two pounds, that's 2.5 ounces, my Wayne Scale said. that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of it, I didn't think of it. So, but my plan, is, my plan is, the next time I give this paper, my plan is that I'm going to assemble Everything you saw there, I'm going to assemble it on my kitchen table, get proper brown paper bags and photograph, so that you, because visual, we are so visual now. We are so visual. And trying to explain to a younger generation what 20 pound of that food looks like is very difficult. So I, I, I went into a chipper yesterday and they gave me some brown paper bags, but I hadn't got time to do it last night and I would have had to go shopping for sugar. So anyway, but I will do it. Over the next few weeks, I am going to do it. But the, this is what uh, a daily allowance. And as Francis said this morning, some people were sharing out their food. So, um, so a family may not have eaten uh, the whole two ounces. They may, and a lot of families had more than five people, but they decided on a sum and a figure, and that was the way it went. The cargoes, every now and again, the cargo changed, and you had shifts, but the, the, the weight of the parcel never changed, never varied. So but subsequent parcels, we had cheese, condensed milk, uh, jam, sugar, tea, margarine, 
uh, the later ships just say margarine, they don't say butter, tin fish rather than dried fish, half a ton of peas, half a ton of salt ribs, packages of haricot beans and 70 tons of potatoes. Now by October, um, a decision was made to source the potatoes in Dublin, uh, not in Dublin, in Ireland, um, and this is what they did. Now, to receive a food parcel, as I said, you needed a voucher. Now, one of the things I want to show you too is trawling through all kinds of photographs. And this is the one you always see. And this is the lady, uh, respectability and the hat. The shawl, the hat is a mark of her respectability. She's too, to, too poor to afford a coat. Some working class women were not all one dimensional derelicts. The working class, as in the working class I grew up in, the working class at that time, it had its various stratas of where everybody fit in in the system and its own little petty snobberies. But she was there, that was her hat. And the children are barefoot. And um, I'm assuming that's a bag of potatoes she's carrying. That's CWS, is it, on the back? Is it? Is that what it is? Yeah, I couldn't read it. I wasn't able to read it. So when you look at that and you look at the, the, the differences, and the newspapers tell us about the differences in the way the women were dressed. And some were dressed like this. Some just had the shawl over the head. And um, some of them had, you know, he said, be ribboned, be hatted and be ribboned. And they make distinctions between the poor and the respectable poor. And being respectable poor was, it, was, was, it, was the thing to be at that time. Now, here are more children queuing. And as you can see, they're well turned out, hat, warm, look fed. And they don't look anything like the children we saw in the first photograph. And here's more. And they're all happily posing for the camera. You know, that's, to have your photograph taken, you know, would, be, would have been a very cool thing to have done in those days. So hit, there they are. Now, Dora Montefiore, those of you who were here this morning, um, came to Dublin. And the, 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 um, the proselytism, the rowing um, that took place, um, it left a very bitter taste. It left a very bitter taste in, 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 in many, many areas of life. Um, but I'm not going to go into it because um, Karen really um, did a really, really, really fine paper on it this morning. But one of the other things, too, is that from about the 28th of September, food was being distributed in Liberty Hall. I'll come back to that. Food was being distributed in Liberty Hall, and um, the Evening Telegraph recorded... A cooking apparatus has been installed in Liberty Hall, and during the day, a large number of people were supplied with bread, stew, and soup. Now, from what I gather, the soup was made from the haricot beans, the peas, uh, the bacon ribs. To, uh, to me, they're bacon ribs. Salt ribs is bacon ribs. And, but Karen made reference to um, Grace Nail peeling potatoes, so there must have been potatoes in the stew as well. So this is, but this is, this is what's in the stew. So it, it sounds a little bit like a Dublin coddle, for those of you who are from Dublin. It sounds a little bit like a Dublin coddle. Sean O'Casey identified the apparatus as a Dagden cauldron, and the TUC had given the Countess £300 for the work. Using James Conley's calculation that 10 shillings would feed one child for a week, this sum would have felt 600 children for three weeks. So we don't know how much the cauldron cost, so we don't know how much money they had left. Nora Conley recalled, and um, Nora Conley is a great description. There's various descriptions of what's going on in Liberty Hall, but I like um, Nora Conley's, have I lost it? I think I've lost it. I must have taken it out. I'll read it to you. Um, I did. I took it out. In my fuss to photograph the potatoes. Sorry, I took it out. <laughs> okay. Nora Conley said, At Liberty Hall, Countess de Markovitz reigned supreme. All meals were prepared under her direction. There were big tubs on the floor, and around these were half a dozen girls peeling potatoes and other vegetables. There were more girls cutting up meat. The Countess kept up a deadly stream around the boilers as she supervised the cooking. Some of the striking girls were there to act as waitresses. Pada Kearney recalled, the Countess was a prominent figure at the kitchen, dressed in trousers and smoking cigarettes, both of which were regarded as astonishing things for women to do in those days. Like I said, the stew was made from the peas, the salted ribs, the haricot beans, um, from the cargo of the food ship. Now, the, this, this stew, this, this is um, operated like a stew house, um, but not as organised as the regular stew houses. And it was chaotic. And one of the things, one of the things um, I didn't address in the book, but, but I've been addressing it in my head ever since, is that you've Countess Markovitz, Delia Larkin, um, some of Countess Markovitz's middle-class friends, let's put it that way, and then the, the women of the, the, women of the uh, workers' union, they did all the peeling and scraping, and all, that, that's what, that was their role. And these are the women, they were there, but if somebody says to you tomorrow, anybody here work in catering? I worked in catering once, that's where I'm coming from with this. I worked in corporate catering once. And if somebody says, okay, next Monday, we're gonna start feeding 600 people stew, um, for the indefinite future, and it may go up to a thousand. I would know how to go about it because I've worked at it. 
if I've never worked at it, you wouldn't have a clue. How are you going to feed people? Okay, so chaos ensued. Without going into the detail, chaos ensued. Um, and then we had, uh, they, they, they had lady visitors coming in. Um, they, there's a piece in the Irish Citizen, which is a little bit derisory towards the, work, the, the women of the workers' union, I have to say. But there's a piece in, in the Irish Citizen about how the Women Franchise League came and they helped to serve the food. Um, then around that time, we Dora Montefiore, because I messed up my slides. Uh, we, we're now at Dora, Dora Montefiore. Um, so she, she came to Dublin and there was, as we heard this morning, um, the, 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 the row, um, the anger, the passions. Um, but one of the other things that wasn't mentioned this morning was quite a lot of nationalist women um, opposed the, the, the movement of children to England as well. I don't like using the expression deportation. So in the midst of this, um, the Archbishop of Dublin, Dr. Walsh, he, he inaugurated a fund um, for the Dublin Distress Fund, Children's Fund. The inaugural meeting was held at the offices of Vincent de Paul in what's now O'Connell Street. And in his address, he said that in the wake of publicity given to the protests against the movement of children to England, he had received many letters from outside of Ireland. And these people outside of Ireland asked them, why did he not get the priests and nuns of Dublin to provide this for the school children with some sort of meal every day? One would think, and then he said, one would think that the clergy and nuns were the relieving officers of the city. Many thought that's what they really were. Now that was, that made some people very, very, very angry um, that he was, he was saying this. Um, and that added fuel to the, already, um, to the already building fire on the issue of moving children. The bishop though, the archbishop, then wanted, wanted to say, defend his administration. And he said that in the year before the lockout, the three parish schools in his administration, he doesn't name them, had provided 1,280 breakfasts and 690 dinners every day and since the beginning of the lockout, this number had increased to 2,450, which was an increase of 480, and the numbers were increasing daily. While the Union and the Archbishop, while the Archbishop's Palace and Liberty Hall, if you like, um, were busy arguing over who held the high moral ground regarding who was best at feeding the poor, the reality on the ground was that the existing charities were picking up the slack, and they simply continued to supply increasing food aid with the help of Catherine Sherlock's um, very modest few pounds. On the 28th of October, James Larkin was imprisoned in England and James Connolly took charge and he made some changes at Liberty Hall, which I go into in a bit more detail in the book. But for the, for the purposes of today, and not going over my time, um, he closed the stew kitchen. Now, when I, was reading the, the, when I was reading this first and I read James Connolly closed the stew kitchen, I thought, okay, the Daily Herald said it. They took it from the Irish Herald, the Daily Herald, uh, no, sorry, the Irish Independent. Okay, let's look at the politics of this. Um, but my instinct was he didn't close the school. He couldn't have done that. And then I tracked the Irish worker and I found the Irish worker. And um, the Irish worker says, yes, that they, it didn't say it was Connolly, just said that they were closed. So the Daily Herald, Daily Herald is quoted in the Independent and it says, Connolly stopped the dinners at Liberty Hall under the supervision of Countess Markovitz for about 600 families. Go to the Archbishop's house and priests, said Connolly. They are loud in their professions. Put them to the test. Now, it's not explained like that in the Irish worker, but loosely using that kind of language is what it says. However, Dora Montefiore gave another perspective on the issue in her biography, and she recorded... We got it right. The authorities at Liberty Hall, relying on publicity given to the statements by the Archbishop, and it goes on, okay decided to discontinue free dinners, which had been the feature at Liberty Hall for some weeks, three weeks, in order to prevent possibility of overlapping, the women and children who had thus been hitherto fed were told to present themselves at the Archbishop's Palace or the Presbyteries or Furious Chapels. Now, bearing in mind that, it, it, bearing in mind that they, they, they got a two pints of stew. So if you visual, the only way I can visualise this, another photograph coming up, the only way you can visualise this is if you think of two pint glasses and full of stew and some bread. Um, and one voucher one quart of stew, one loaf of bread. So this is what they're getting in the Biddy Hall, and it's all chaotic. And the women and children are queuing for hours uh, to receive this money. After the collapse of the deportation scheme, the money raised by Dora Montefiore, Grace Neal and Mrs Rand was used to open a new breakfast kitchen at Liberty Hall. So the money they had raised was put to good use. The, the dinners in Liberty Hall were never resumed, ever. They just opened a breakfast, a breakfast kitchen and the children were given bread, jam and cocoa. 
Now, I photographed it just for the heading. Don't worry about the, the text. And I highlighted it because sometimes my eyes don't work too well. So women and, the women and Children of Locked Out Workers Relief Fund. That's the official name. And every time I try to say it, it comes out. Blah, blah, blah. So I thought if I put it up there, you can see. And you can read all of this. This is from the Irish worker. This new breakfast kitchen operated under the stewardship of Patrick Lennon and it was officially called the Women and Children of Locked Out Workers Relief Fund. From now on, we just call it the Liberty Hall Fund. We find a way around it. And it now became the official committee that provided breakfast as well as clothes for the children at Liberty Hall. Sean O'Casey was appointed Assistant Secretary, while Delia Larkin and Grace Nail founded the Ladies' Committee. And they called them, in these articles, they called the two women the Ladies' Committee. Connolly gave the committee an office at Liberty Hall, and you can see here. Now, before this, where Patrick Lennon comes from, and Sean O'Casey, and what's their involvement? When the lockout began, and when they started to uh, give the stew um, in, in Liberty Hall, Patrick Lennon, who lived in East Wall, set up a relief fund um, to, to collect clothes for the children for the coming winter. And himself and Sean O'Casey, now I'm not sure who else was on his committee, but he operated from his own house in East Wall. And so this was his committee. And he was operating parallel to the stew kitchen. So in, for me, what I found interesting about this, I didn't know this till I started doing this research. So I began to reevaluate what Sean O'Casey was saying about Countess de Markovitz in his biographies. Now, I didn't go back and reread read them. But the thing is, he was there on the ground. He did see it. And his comments um, have, to be taken, have to be taken seriously enough for you to consider what he's saying and where he's coming from and the fact that he was there. He was there, and he saw, and he felt, and he was hungry too. So all of that needs to be taken into account. But that means moving it from the political, removing from the political, and looking at it from um, this humanitarian way of perceiving what's going on. So now they are the official. So jo jo um, Patrick Lennon and Sean O'Casey, now he didn't call himself Sean O'Casey then, but it's easier to just say Sean O'Casey for the purposes of the talk. Um, they, they were the fundraisers, they had the money from the Daily Herald League, but they still had to raise money in Dublin. They raised money from the theatres, boxing, boxing tournaments, concerts, cinema shows, basically people sent in cheques, and you'll find all of this in the Irish Worker, it's there. Not vast amounts, but enough to feed the children. And then, they had, then they, um, that, the two men were in charge of this, coming in the money, using the money, uh, keeping the accounts, all of that, that's what they did. And then um, Delia Larkin and, and, and Grace Snail organized the kitchen. And Grace Nail started out life, as we heard this morning, as a parlour maid. She obviously had, from reading the material, she had skills in how to organize feeding small children. And they organized them, they sat them down, they gave them, the, there are great photographs. There are more photographs than the one I showed you this morning. There are more photographs of them, the children sitting, they have a mug and a plate, it's dignified, um, and they're being fed. So this, this is, um, and for me, um, every now and again, we talk about people who are forgotten in a story, people who are pushed out of a story. And when it comes to the, the women and children who are being fed during the lockout, Grace Nail's name is missing, and it's an absolute disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace that her name is missing and her photograph. And I feel very strongly about that, having read it, um, having read the material and studied um, all of this material. This new breakfast room opened on the 12th of November, and they also opened a clothing room. So the, the collecting of clothes... And the feeding of children now was under, operated under this committee. Grace Nail said in a piece when she wrote that initially they provided meals for 500 children, but the lane outside the hall, which is Old Abbey Street, uh, was crowded and they had to empty the room and refill it again. And they had enough bread and jam and cocoa to do that, so they were able to do that. She also said, um, Patrick Lennon and Grace Nail also said that the preparing of the food uh, was organised by a man called Paddy Murta, and she, they have in brackets of hornpipe fame, which I'm intrigued. Obviously, he was a member of the, the Transport Union Band, but I can't find out any more about him, who was ably supported by numbers of locked out women, as well as the daughters of some locked out workers. And these women, they helped prepare the food, set the tables, and clean up afterwards. Like I said, the original dinner scheme was completely scrapped, and the kitchen now only prepared cooked breakfast for the children. But in December, the committee noticed that as women, you know, women would bring small children in for clothes and sometimes they would come in for, to get the food as well. And they noticed the pregnant women and nursing women, when we were still breastfeeding, were gone. And they decided to do something about it. So they set up um, a dinner scheme for these pregnant and nursing women. And every day they fed 75 women and they gave them a good solid meal. And um, 
th th to help them through it and they also gave them warm clothes to get them through the winter. Now, when we're looking at the food, and we're looking, so we're looking at, we've seen what came in the parcels. It wasn't a huge amount of food. We've heard from Francis that they were sharing the food. Um, two pints of stew wasn't going to go very far, and then it's gone. So where else were they getting food? They were getting foods from the existing charities in the city. It's something that does need to be acknowledged. And while, while there is a great political discussion on the Archbishop and, and Liberty Hall, while they were doing all of that outside of it, on the ground, the children were being fed. The people in these religious institutions and non-denominational institutions simply got on with feeding people who needed to be fed. And it needs to be recorded that this happened. Grace Nail also did allow visitors, but she, not, unlike the three weeks of Cantus de Markowitz, they weren't allowed to just come and gawk, if you like, to use the Dublin expression, at the poor receiving their remittance of bowl of soup. And um, they were given a job, but they were not allowed into the kitchen. So they were given the job of bringing food and clothing vouchers to some of the families in the tenements. And she said, and I quote, where they saw the horrors of tenement houses. And she said also that it was the hardest job to keep filled. She said many of them didn't come back. They were completely traumatised by their experiences of seeing how people lived in the tenements. By late November, the kitchen was providing a thousand breakfasts every day. And by January 1914, the number receiving breakfasts had increased to between 2,500 and 3,000. This food commission was kitchen was independent, if you like, of the union. It, it relied on the Daily Herald League. The Daily Herald League had a branch in Dublin and subscriptions and fundraising events in the city and then people who sent in checks. And it is, if, if, you ha if, if anyone's interested in any of this, if you go to the Irish Worker and you read um, who's sending, they, they acknowledge people, um, it, it's, it's very, very, very interesting. So under the auspices of the Dublin Children's Distress Fund, um, the Vincent de Paul, end up running this, collecting the money, allocating the money. And one of the things that happened is Catherine Sherlock, and there's also um, a dinner committee um, headed by Maud Gone, and they had been raising money. I won't go into it, but they had been raising money before the lockout for, for school children as well. But the funds coming into Catherine Sherlock and Maud Gone's uh, school dinner committee dried up because people were giving money either to the bishop or they were sending it to Liberty Hall. So Maud Gone's organisation and Catherine's Catch and Sherlock's organisation attached themselves to the, to the Children's Distress Fund. So that fund became an umbrella um, for uh, looking after the children and the families and, and feeding the children in schools. It became the umbrella body. And what they did was, in the, in the city and county, there are some terrific accounts um, of, of committees in various, in various parishes where um, they set up 16 parish committees in the city and county. And this is the other thing about the lockout, that the, the, the impression is that it was confined to this small geographic area of the North City, South City, but it extended out into the county. And at that time, um, Crumlin, Rialto, they were slightly outside the county. But, um, but you're also looking at Lucan, you're looking at Clondalkin. Um, many, many of them out there had problems as well. So they, they, uh, they, are, organizing, um, they are organizing food, um, these 16 committees. And within two weeks, these parish committees, because they are keeping uh, central records, now, Vincent and Paul wouldn't let me in to read the material, so I found all of this in the newspapers and in, a, in, the, in the Vincent and the Paul reports, which are actually in um, the diocesan archives, and these reports are there as well. So within two weeks, the parish committees were providing a meal or two meals every day for 10,000 children, with the sisters in the convent schools and the teachers in the national schools doing the actual work of feeding and clothing the children. Now... The difference, primary schools are primary schools, but the difference is you have a religious run school where they have the wherewithal to have space to feed children. Local parish schools don't, didn't have that. So they had to find a way of feeding the children. Um, and it, it couldn't be too complicated because there was no space. And while they didn't have health and safety in those days, they still weren't able to feed small children in a school. Like the school I went to um, was a parish school. And I imagine in 1913 they were trying to feed. It. I don't know how they would have done it, but the logistics of that would have been difficult. Many mothers were unable to cope with their poverty and they refused to queue. Many women, um, totally embarrassed by being reduced to such destitution, to be seen out of her house in a state of destitution, not to be underestimated, not absolutely, as, as a woman, I have to say, not to be underestimated. So the committee devised a strategy to help them by channeling aid to the various religious orders. And the sisters, a lot of these convents had sisters who visited the poor in their own homes. And under the guise of visitations, they would bring people food. 
On Christmas Eve 1913, the Denda Lane Penny Dinners recorded that in 1913, they had distributed 50,850 meals in that year, which was double the amount they had provided in the year before. Providing clothing for children was another major part of the aid given to the poor. At Liberty Hall, Delia Larkin and Grace Nail provided clothes for the children, and they had received large cases of new and second-hand clothing from uh, England, we heard that this morning, from Glasgow, Plymouth and London, as well as ro rolls of cloth and flannelette. Anybody here ever sleep in flannelette pyjamas? They are so cosy. They are, <laughs> and as I get older, I keep on, and when I saw that, I thought, yeah, right, that's how you keep your babies warm, and when you get older, that's how you keep warm. On the 24th of November, a sewing room was opened under the, um, and three sewing machines were donated by women workers to Liberty Hall. Now, there was a co-op in Liberty Hall after this, but this is before this co-op. And maybe the co-op afterwards, the idea for that came from this. But they three sewing machines and women donated them. Obviously, the, the number of the women in the, in the Women Workers Union, or even not in the Women Workers Union, would have been dressmakers, like Maria Perals, who we would hear about in relation to 1916. She was a dressmaker. So you, you get a lot of women who are dressmakers and very skilled, and they would be in a position to loan a machine because their work would have dried up as well. And they're in Liberty Hall and they're doing this work. They provided clothing for almost 3,000 children and maternity wear for 150 women. And they also gave some, some clothes to the women who were helping on the relief committee. Meanwhile, the Dublin Children's Distress Fund was also supplying clothing and it recorded in its, in its accounts that it had distributed over 10,000 items of children's clothing. On the 18th of January, the union informed the press that the dispute was effectively over. On the 28th of February 1914, due to lack of funds, provision of breakfasts for the 3,000 children at Liberty Hall ceased. Likewise, the Dublin Children's Distress Fund, um, which had provided at its end, was providing between 9 and 10,000 meals a day, was closed in the middle of February, and they also closed the food depot. People just simply stopped donating. Money just ran out. That was it. In the immediate aftermath of the lockout, many working class families were rendered helpless in the face of extreme poverty. Thousands of children were still hungry. There is, I've heard once or twice in passing in the last while that um, children were better fed during the lockout than they had been before and after. And having studied all of the stuff I've studied in the last four months, that can't be sustained. It just can't be sustained. Thousands of children were still hungry as many men failed to get their jobs back. They were now dependent on the long-established charities in the city for the thousands of men and women in Dublin life had become a nightmare of unimagined proportions. So when all these food, all these food and pouring him's depots closed, they simply went back to the people they had been using before the lockout to get the food they needed to keep their children alive. Within weeks, the stories of the lockout and the suffering of women and children disappeared from the newspapers. They had made great press. The press made great great fuss of them and the stories of them um, it, during that period. By August 1914, and inverted commas, her, the heroic respectable poor had become the ghosts of a failed enterprise as many of the men joined the British Army and the women with their children were left to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives wherever way they could. A hundred years ago, for a brief period, the Irish newspapers informed and entertained its readers with the horrors of the poverty paraded in the city to excite the sympathy of the beholder. Currently, the media have been discussing food poverty and of families reduced to want in the current recession and the opening of new penny dinners, charities throughout the country. And like in 2011, I couldn't get the figures for 2012, the Merchants Key project um, produced 73,000 meals. And while some things change, some things remain the same. And now we have people today, 100 years later, who are at that place where my granny and my mother was 100 years ago, hungry and dependent on charity for food.